it's my house. I went in placement all the time with the train set. So if, if they determined to, that to be my footprint, that doesn't really prove anything. I got nightmares in my head. I fear thoughts build up until I can't My mind fills up into a creature and it haunts me somewhere much deeper. I got nightmares in my head. I fear thoughts build up until I can't hear that my mind fills up into a creature and it haunts me somewhere much deeper. Hello and a warm welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. Well, if this analysis doesn't blow your socks off, I'm not sure what will. Fasten your seatbelts, here we go. There is an incredible moment with profound insight and huge implications for the Ramsey case in the first 90 seconds of Dr. Phil's third and final interview with Burke Ramsey, remember the one in 2016, holding up an image of a shoe imprint left in the grit of the wine cellar that's in the basement. Dr. Phil asks Burke if he recognizes it. There was a footprint in the mold on the ground of the basement. Dr. Phil asks Burke if he recognizes it. And when Dr. Phil refers to the footprint, as evidence against Burke, Burke's eyes widen. And the investigators thought that it was from a hiking boot. Yeah. Did, did you own any hiking boots that you might have worn in the basement at some time? Well, how do you think Burke answers? Yeah, I did. I don't remember the brand, but I, I remember it had a little compass on the shoelace. And the investigators point to that footprint as evidence against you. Yeah, it's my house. I wouldn't play in the basement all the time. Effectively, Burke doesn't deny that it is his shoe print. Instead, he seems to be saying, so what if it is? It doesn't prove anything. Is he right? Now, this analysis is going to deal with just the high-tech aspect, as if it's an onion. We're going to peel away one layer at a time until we have five layers in all. Each layer represents a deeper, more sophisticated level of thinking. It also shows how easy it is to get trapped, perhaps forever, perhaps for decades, inside a single layer of reasoning. And while we're going through these layers, I do want you to consider which layer you've been trapped inside and also whether you've graduated from one layer to another. Because as you're about to see, we're going to get a very rare glimpse into the grand jury investigation, right? It's going to take us right into the soft yellow butter of this case, the truth that has always been just beyond our reach because of legal hurdles and loopholes. Also, as we peel away layer by layer, I suspect we may have found, may perhaps have stumbled upon a useful formula for trying to figure out other misdirections in this case. Worth playing for? Yeah. Before we get to that, if you're not one of the 175,000 subscribers to this channel, please do subscribe. If you're finding this analysis worthwhile, well thought out, meaningful, interesting, please like, share, leave a comment. You can also hit the thanks button and let's get started. So number one, is it genuine or a ruse? In this setting with Dr. Phil, Dr. Phil seems to be seems to be genuinely asking serious questions, questions of an evidentiary nature to Burke Ramsey. He holds up photos of evidence. He refers to a file that seems to have factual and pertinent aspects. And the, the context, though, is the 20-year anniversary of the Ramsey case, and ultimately Dr. Phil himself seems to exonerate the Ramses, that's everyone, including Burke, basically throwing his weight behind them and expressing his opinion on their innocence. Now, I'll put a link to that. You can watch him doing that in a video in the description. But consider his response to a seemingly simple question from someone in his audience. And the question was, has Burke ever been considered a suspect? What does Dr. Phil say? 
All right, what's um, your question? Has Burke ever been considered a suspect at any point? Absolutely, unequivocally, no. I'm just wondering if Dr. Full is interviewing Burke and asking him directly if he ever hit his sister with a baseball bat or a flashlight, also referring to evidence against him, also referring to BDI theories. You know, if he's doing that, why is he doing that? If he was never considered a suspect, if this isn't about him being considered a suspect and, well, what is the evidence against him? Isn't that why this was such a highly anticipated episode on the 20-year anniversary? So if Dr. Full himself is asking these questions and says, well, he was never considered a suspect, one does wonder, how can one say that? How can you say absolutely not when one detective wrote a book with a BDI theory and CBS made a documentary and were sued in, into silence for suspecting Burke? Now, I'm not trying to make the case here for who killed John, but I'm just wondering why Dr. Phil would shut down this question unequivocally. Dr. Phil is also clearly a fan of the intruder theory, which I believe a small minority of folks on this channel take seriously. I have to go in because nobody can see it. It's astounding to me that when you go back and read this record, the Boulder police say an intruder could not get in the basement window and you just saw a 60-something-year-old man just slide in the window. That's Lou Smith, the investigator. It's astounding to me. So yeah, you have Dr. Phil literally showing the intruder theory, showing the arch apologist for the intruder theory, Lou Smith, doing his whole demonstration and then openly laughing, openly sort of gleeful at the and sort of scornful at the police investigation and theory. But there's also another way. And so the question here is, is Dr. Phil's interview with Burke genuine or is it a ruse? Is there a strategy behind it or is it just a sincere, let's ask a couple of questions? But there is a, another way to determine whether this interview with Burke is genuine or a ruse. Burke is asked a question about those high-tech boots and does he actually answer the question? You know, it's one thing to be asked a question. It's another thing, does he answer it in kind of a black and white way, yes or no? Well, he seems to, doesn't he? He says he did have hiking boots. He says they did have a compass on, which is the high-tech logo, but he says he couldn't remember the brand. And so the answer is he actually doesn't answer the question, not in the terms that it's asked. He also says, and this is the important part, he says, it's my house. Instead of saying, it's my shoe print, or yes, I did actually go into the room. Because when we're talking about all of this, we, we're saying there's a shoe print in the wine cellar, and the wine cellar is critical in this case as the, the ground zero of the crime scene, right? So if his shoe print is there, isn't that placing him inside the crime scene? And that's really what it's all about. Burke, were you standing there? Were you in the crime scene? Did you commit this crime? And that's really what the shoe print um, aspect's all about. And instead of saying, yes, I did stand there, yes, I was in that room, he's basically saying he did have, he did have a certain kind of shoes, not specifically high techs. He says he was in the basement, not specifically in that room. And then he adds that he was usually in the train room part of the basement. So it is kind of a denial. It's like, yes, I was in the basement, but not in that room. Of course, the real question behind the question is whether Burke Ramsey was in the wine cellar, the room where John Bonet was found. And that brings us to number two, the obvious but wrong inference. Now, in recent analysis, we've dealt with the where of this case, and a huge majority of you guys, about two-thirds, 66%, seem to think the where of this crime, the where of this case, where this, this crime was committed, is the basement. That may seem very obvious, and I'm looking forward to challenging your thought process significantly on this particular question. If I do my job, well, then that number is going to come down as we deal with this issue more directly. 
in an upcoming video. Now, the obvious inference if the shoe print is Burke's is that, as I say, Burke was in the wine cellar, and if he's in the wine cellar, that means he killed John Bonnet. Do you see how important the where is in this case? And where Burke is, I agree, is a key to figuring out this case. But, and there is a but, but the bigger key is where John Bonnet was. Because if John Bonnet was brought to the wine cellar from somewhere else and Burke's shoe print happens to be there, well, then that doesn't mean anything. If John Bonnet was somewhere and that is where she died and Burke's evidence is in that place, then that is significant. Is that what we're dealing with when we're dealing with the high-tech shoe print? And that brings us to number three. What is the real truth of the matter? Well, this is my opinion. A, it is a high-tech shoe. B, it is Burke's shoe. C, Burke's shoe print in the basement wine cellar doesn't automatically mean he is the killer. D, the torn gift in the wine cellar was very likely a gift meant for Burke, not Christmas presents as indicated in the caption, but possibly for his birthday. These gifts were possibly meant for his birthday, held back for his birthday in January. And he is the likeliest member of the entire family, in my opinion, to have torn it. In this regard, very interestingly, Patsy said she tore it. She tore this gift because she'd forgotten what was actually inside it and did so. Again, this is my opinion. The reason that she did it was to cover for Burke, was a way to prevent the the thinking that Burke was in this room of all the rooms in the Ramsey home. She didn't want suspicion to fall on her son. Number four, Lynn's legalese. Now, if at one moment it seemed like Burke was gifting Dr. Phil's audience with a major confession, basically the first time in 20 years that someone is basically saying the, this print in the grit belongs to this member of the Ramsey family. That would have been a major breakthrough. Well, the very next moment cuts to Linwood throwing ice-cold water on any such thought because he says the following. Burke Ramsey never owned a pair of high-tech boots. So that one example shows you that I'm absolutely right when I talk about this so-called theory about Burke. Nobody in the Ramsey family owned any high-tech boots. Number five, a hot knife through butter. Now we come to it. Imagine if we could simply pull open a PDF file. We could just click on an icon, PDF file, and it's the grand jury trial. And imagine if we could look at what is found with regard to high-tech boots. Are they Burks or aren't they? Well, what if we could? And if we could, what do you think the answer is? Give me your hand now and let me take you where angels fear to tread into a paragraph of a page, basically derivative, derived from the grand jury files. Do you recall a period of time prior to 1996 when your son Burke purchased a pair of hiking boots that had compasses on the shoelaces? And if it helps to remember, well, Patsy says, I can't remember. She kind of cuts him off. She's asked, maybe this will help your recollection. They were shoes that were purchased while he was shopping with you in Atlanta. And then Lynn Wood says, what, are you stating that as a fact? Mr. Levin says, I am stating that as a fact. Now some document, something is shown to Patsy, and then she's asked, perhaps a photograph. Does that help refresh your recollection, Patsy, as to whether Burke owned a pair of shoes that had compasses on them? Patsy responds, I just can't remember, bought so many shoes for him. Levin says, and again, I will provide, I'll, I'll, say, I'll say this is a fact to you, that, and maybe, maybe this will refresh your recollection, he thought that the shoes were special because they had a compass on them. His only exposure for the most part to compasses had been in the plane, and he kind of liked the idea of being able to point them in different directions. Do you remember him doing that with the shoes? Patsy responds, I can't remember the shoes. I remember he had a compass thing like a watch, but I can't remember about the shoes. Now, the interesting thing is, 
In the interview with Dr. Phil, he, he mentions the compass thing as well. Levin goes on to point out, you don't remember him having shoes that you purchased with compasses on? Linwood, obviously aggravated, answers on Patsy's behalf, kind of aggravated. She will tell you that one more time. Go ahead and tell him, and this will be the third time. Patsy responds, I can't remember. Mr. Levin then continues, he persists, he says, Okay, does it jog your memory to know that the shoes with compasses were made by a high-tech? And then Mr. Wood says, are you stating that as a fact? Levin says, yes, I am stating that as a fact. Patsy says, no, I didn't know that. Le Levin then continues, he says, I will state this as a fact. There are two people who have provided us with information, including your son, meaning including Burke, that he owned high-tech shoes prior to the murder of your daughter. Wood then says, you are stating that Burke Ramsey has told you he owned high-tech shoes. Levin says, yes. Wood says, he used the phrase high-tech. Levin says, yes. Wood, when? Levin says, I can't, I can't give you the source. I can tell you that I have that information. Wood, you said Burke told you. Levin, I can't quote it to you for reasons I am sure as an attorney you are aware. Wood, just so it is clear, there is a difference between you saying that somebody said Burke told them and Burke telling you because Burke has been interviewed by you, all of you, in December of 1996, January of 1997, June of 1998. Are you saying that is within those interviews? Levin, no. Wood, so he didn't tell you, he told somebody else, you are standing as a fact because I don't think you all have talked to him other than those occasions, have you? Kane, now Kane interrupts the prosecutor. He says, Mr. Wood, we don't want to get into grand jury information, okay? And here it seems like Wood suddenly sees what this is all about, where all of this comes from. And he concedes, he says, okay. Kane then says, fair enough. Then Levin goes on. He says, I'm sorry. I thought I should have been more direct. I thought you would understand. And then Levin adds, Fleet Jr. also says that he had high-tech shoes. So what do we apparently learn from this? Well, this is what I think we learn from this. A, Burke did have high-tech shoes. B, Burke admitted under oath to the grand jury that he owned a pair of high-tech shoes or boots. This is certainly what we infer from the above. C. It seems the second person who confirmed Burke owned high-tech shoes besides Burke was possibly Fleet Jr. or a close relative of Fleet Jr. because Fleet Jr. had the same type of shoes as Burke as well. D. This means the shoe print in the basement is very likely Burke's. E. Burke is absolutely right, though, in saying, it's my house, I, I went to play in the basement all the time. But if it's true that it is his shoe print, if he wanted to be 100% transparent, perhaps he could have said, it's my house, and I did go into the wine cellar over Christmas to see what else I was getting, to, to see which other gifts were meant for me. Now, the part that I find fascinating is that the Ramsey family lawyer is on Dr. Phil in 2016, unambiguously denying that any member of the Ramsey family had high-tech footwear, including Burke. It's fascinating because we have a record of the same person being told directly in what looks like a deposition 16 years earlier, well, something else. So how can he be so confident in saying something like that in an interview on television? And this is my opinion. Isn't it because he assumed, perhaps because of secrecy laws around grand jury statements, perhaps he thought this information would never have filtered through, would never be allowed to filter through, would never be uh, permitted to percolate its way to the surface? Isn't that an allegory for the grand jury indictments themselves? You have a situation where the public are dying to know what really happened, absolutely you know dying to know details meanwhile all of those details are patently obvious that they are patently available to the lawyers and legal folks surrounding this case except due to secrecy laws they can make statements that can't be challenged 
can't be checked, can't be tested, which then makes it appear as though these statements are true. For example, the long-held opinion that no, there was no evidence, and I'm not going to take this any further, and the, the, the grand jury didn't vote to indict the Ramses. Well, if you can't test that, aren't you going to assume it to be true? It was assumed that the grand jury didn't vote to indict the Ramses until someone simply went to the trouble to check. And what did they find? And so perhaps the same can be said for the high-tech shoes. One can assume because someone said there weren't any, and then, but then this can't be challenged in theory. Because it can't be challenged, then that becomes the truth. But it's not the truth. At the end of the day, all we seem to learn from the high-tech aspect is that Patsy covered for Burke. The family lawyer said something. He gave what appears to be a wrong assumption. These may seem small issues, but are there larger parallels elsewhere? So if you say Patsy may have covered for Burke with regard to the high-tech print and the tear in the wrapping, could she have tried to cover for him in some other aspect? Could she have been trying to cover for him in something like the ransom note? And in terms of the whole legal thing where the person says there's there, nobody had any high-tech shoes, but there's no way to verify that, well, think about the grand jury ruse. Is that a parallel as well? Because you don't know something, can one be misled into assuming things that aren't actually the way they are. What do you think? Now, I'm not going to take it further than that, but I also don't want us to leave this rabbit hole empty-handed because there is something else Burke said to Dr. Phil, besides that it was his house, and besides that I went to play in the basement all the time. Did you notice what it was? He adds something to his statement. It's my house. I went and played in the basement all the time with the train sets. He adds something to the statement, and that is what we're going to talk about next in our ongoing investigation into where. Thank you for listening, and I'll see you guys next time. 